Hello and welcome everybody to another episode of the Planning Commission Podcast Season 3 Premiere. Today's episode, Let's All Go to the Park with Mitchell Silver. The Planning Commission Podcast is a discussion you never even knew you needed. Sit back, join us for a conversation between a couple of old friends and their guests to talk about all the things that are happening in this wide-ranging profession called planning. Our views are our own and don't reflect those of any national planning organizations or any particular public agencies and only belong to us. So read your commission packet, know your Robert's Rules, and enjoy this, the Planning Commission Podcast. Okay. We got a new face today on our episode, and it's a new guest host, so we're excited. But first and foremost, Commissioner Kostelik, you here? I am present, yes. And Commissioner Sabrina Minshall, are you here? I am present. <laughs> All right. We are going to have uh, Sabrina take a quick second and introduce herself to our audience. Sabrina, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I'm technically still a Southern girl. You will not hear the accent unless I get oh, really man. tired or really right. mad or more than slightly intoxicated. The accent yeah. comes back. Yeah. So uh, after South, though, I spent most of my high school, college, professional career in the Idaho area. Um, I've been lucky. I've worked at a lot of varieties of different levels of government, uh, city, a highway district, Metropolitan Planning Organizations, um, and now a, I would say kind of what used to be rural and now is not so much county, um, and development services throughout. So got to get work in code enforcement, community development, planning, and I even did a couple of years stint uh, in a nonprofit working in downtown revitalization. So most of my career here, but also in the Spokane area for almost four years. Um, it's great to be here, and it's great to be able to talk about the perspectives. Well, we thank you for joining us, and and your resume is is pretty something. It's it's definitely special. It truly it is. You have run the gamut of planning in a I, way. I that do many... I do appreciate how you say special. It's special. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean everything's special about you, especially a cowboy fan. I mean, but yeah. Thank you. you know. <laughs> thank you. I did I did open that when I said from the south. So. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, let's kick off our episode here today. Um, our agenda. Our discussion, discussion item, our whiskey pairing, our interview with Mitchell Silver, and our lightning round. So, commissioners, can I get a motion to approve? So moved. And second. All right. And to our listeners, just a reminder, you can find all our past meetings and on our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Head to YouTube, go to Amazon or Apple, uh, Spotify, and Deezer. Subscribe, like, give us all the feedback that you want. We'd love to have it and maybe some future episodes. Man, I'm excited. Mitchell Silver. If you don't know Mitchell Silver, I don't know where you've been, mm -hmm. but uh, we'll get into his background in a little bit in a minute. But I want to start off with this discussion about parks, planning, how all these things kind of come together. Commissioners. Here's a real easy question. Tell me about your favorite park as a kid and why was it your favorite park as a kid? Oh, I'll give you a second to think about that. I will start because I'll give you the give you a quick moment. Man, I remember my preschool teacher used to walk us over to a park a few blocks away. And there was a I will never forget this. It was a great park, but it also had a playground that had a concrete airplane in it right wow. really big plane and i know and i would climb up on the wing you can get up in the cockpit well guess what that did that inspired me because i wanted to be a pilot my whole mm. youth and mm. while i never i did fly once technically but i did as, as i've heard or i've talked about in the past five years of naval aviation and you know that's what i did for a bunch of years all over the globe and doing the things that I did that I can't always talk about in even to this day. But nevertheless, I think that that concrete airplane, when I was in preschool, planted a pretty, pretty sizable seed in my brain and ultimately led and made probably a big reason to who, who and where I am today. So that's mine. Top it. What do you got? <laughs> Man, I remember going, growing up in suburban Atlanta. It's not like we had neighborhood parks or anything, but yeah. uh, Nick Nickajack Park in Cobb County is just one of those. I remember early on of 
going out with my grandmother and and that and just the the trails the ponds the ball fields um places like that it still sticks with me uh, to this day probably as much from just the familial experience and the quality of time i had with my grandmother in doing that as much as what the park was but i think it speaks to what these places mean from uh, an interpersonal emotional family social all of those health dynamics that we talk about Awesome. What do you got, Sabrina? It, it's such a great question, Chris. I didn't realize how ingrained in our brains those times are. So yeah, my favorite was absolutely, I. we lived in um, suburban Hillsbury or Hillsboro, Oregon. And it had, we only lived there from when I was three to like just over five and a half. So I'm surprised I remember these things, but it was a neighborhood park, extremely wooded. I remember, especially that age, it felt huge. It, we always walked there. And it was like this enchanted forest. Like there were just, it was all covered. And then there'd be little pockets of wooden play structures everywhere. But in Hillsboro, all the whole entire way was lined of wild blackberries and raspberries. Oh man. And so yeah. whenever we went, we'd always come back. And it's associated with my grandmother, especially, would, you know, make raspberry cobbler or you know, they she was canning raspberries or blackberries. And back even you know, we would just grab them and eat them. And it, it's such a vivid memory that. I have no idea how big the park actually is or what was there, right, but that's all I right. remember is blackberries, raspberries. And it was like this enchanted forest that you could just get lost in. Hmm. Yeah. Just the other day I went for a walk near our river and as I was walking back, I saw two, what I thought were men on a bike sitting there and I'm like, this looks really weird. And I kind of felt like, I don't know what's going on. And I, there was a part of me, I was a little like, ah, what's happening here? Oh my gosh. There's a dad and a son sitting there picking blackberries off a blackberry bush. And then they offered them to me as I walked <laughs> by and I'm like, Oh, heaven forbid. That was really dumb of me. But anyway, yeah, great memories, man. And, and mm -hmm. special places, right. Uh, and, and obviously it meant the world to us then. And even to this day. So all right, now our whiskey pairing before we turn it over to our interview with the one and only Mitchell Silver. Don, what do you have? Yeah, so I first got to experience Mitchell when he was in the Raleigh, North Carolina area, and I had moved back to near where I grew up in Asheville, and and just this uh, man with an aura about him, especially at the first state APA conference, and was really bummed. And immediately after that, he was named to what was probably an opportunity of a lifetime of parks commissioner for New York City uh, for that. And that was, you know, for those of us in North Carolina at the time and being younger, I'm like, wow, that's quite the leap. How do you go from the, the triangle up to there? So I went a little bit different than the whiskey. I went with a cocktail for this one, uh, Death and Company, a cocktail bar in New York City. I'm just going with their straight up and, and given where... Mitchell was parks commissioner. I'm going with the Manhattan uh, oh. as the cocktail. Classic, sophisticated, smooth, professional to me. That's everything Mitchell embodies, not just from today's topic and parks, because he's so much more varied planning overall, inspiration through leadership and American Planning Association and all of that. So we'll raise that glass. Absolutely. Perfect. Well done. Well done. All right. So before we have our interview with Mitchell real quick, so we want to make sure to take a second and thank our partners at Plan Edison. We would like to take a quick moment and thank them and uh, for the support of today's podcast. If you're looking to sharpen your urban planning skills and advance your planning career, head on over to Plan Edison courses, which offer over 300 courses on cutting edge planning topics and skills such as parking reform, missing middle housing, equity analysis, and climate resilience. Visit courses.planedison.com forward slash slash PC10 to take advantage of an exclusive offer for Planning Commission podcast listeners. So now, without further ado, are you kidding me? We have a person with us today who was selected to speaking of Plan Edison's, their list of 100 most influential urbanists in the world, Mitchell Silver, principal at McAdams. Mitchell, welcome to the Planning Commission podcast. Thank you, Chris. It is a pleasure to be here. Oh man, we we really gratefully are grateful for your time. So why don't you just hit us off? Tell us about you, your extensive background, and how the heck did you go through this wonderful career of yours and, and where you are today? Well, I'll certainly give the reader's digest version. And I have to say, uh, when you talked about favorite park as commissioner, that was a question I got often. And for me, it was Prospect Park. Uh, mm -hmm. This was Umstead Design Park, literally three blocks from my house. 
And being in dense New York City, that was our exposure to nature and memories from running to family outings to learning how to ride a bike. Uh, it's all the things that really stayed with me when I became parks commissioner. But I had a Forrest Gump life uh, throughout my entire career, <laughs> just being in the right place at the right time. Most people don't know I was a high school dropout, kind of a very difficult story. My mother dying at a young age. And mm -hmm. so I kind of uh, struggled through. But when I found my way, uh, it was a school of architecture, found out about urban planning and fell in love that I literally could be a doctor of cities and help people thrive. So I think that's where it started. And from there, I had some amazing jobs in New York City, working for the Manhattan Borough President, working for the Department of City Planning, but also got active in the American Planning Association. And I'm very grateful uh, taking acting classes and public speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a gift of storytelling, so I merged my passion for planning and people uh, into presenting. And so my career launched. You know, from there, I had a great opportunity to be uh, deputy director in Washington, D.C., uh, and then from there went on to Raleigh, North Carolina, where I was a planning director and helped that city really help transform itself. And then I got called by the mayor uh, to come up to New York City. Uh, initially, they said they interviewed me to be the planning commissioner for New York. I didn't get the job, and I loved it so much in North Carolina. I was so relieved. And then they called back and said, hey, would you want to be, would you consider being parks commissioner? And I said no, and they were oh, stunned. Wow. This is New York City. It's like, you know, you don't say no to New York. And, and, and the transition team asked me why. I said, because parks is 80% operations and 20% planning. Mm -hmm. And they responded by saying, that's why we want you. Mm -hmm. We want to rethink our parks in the 21st century. And so uh, that's how I got to New York City. Apart from that, uh, being very active in the American Planning Association, serve on a board, but then president. Uh, between 2011 and 2013, when planning was under a lot of pressure. We heard about the Tea Party. There was a major recession. Planning department was shrinking. And I had to really pivot to be more inspirational, to remind planners their value and important role that they play. The New York City, even though I was North Carolina, heard about me speaking really across the world and coming up with very innovative approaches. Married those two together when I came to New York City and did some very, very innovative work brought urban planning to the parks department. And by the time I had stepped down in 2021, we completed over 850 transformative park projects uh, during that eight years. And so that now led me back to North Carolina where I'm now a private consultant, but focusing both on park spaces, urban design and urban planning. Wow, that's amazing. Um, later, I want to talk about inspiring planners because I think we're coming back through that cycle. Um, mm. But I I have a curious question about, I guess, history of park design, how things have changed. But but more specifically, what did you see through New York? So as you were saying, no, you know, you didn't want to be a parks commission, but based upon that history, and not only design right. but how it looks. Right. How did you see that change, and and you know, and then what? Well. Sabrina, thank you for that question, because actually it's something I thought deeply about. Uh, if you think about our park system, it actually originated in Europe, and they called it parks and gardens. These were spaces that you just walk through and observe the beauty. You didn't have a picnic. You didn't recreate. You just walk through. There were no benches. So you stroll through these open spaces, and then it carried over to the United States. Frederick Law Olmsted was really the grandfather of landscape architecture, and realized that was now the really the 19th century, now the late 19th century, early 20th century, this profession called landscape architecture emerged. And they had the idea of creating this central park in Boston, you know, they had their parks as well. And for the first time, as our country was urbanizing and more important people were living in our cities, initially people were going to cemeteries for open space. Mm -hmm. And so we recognize we need these green lungs, these green spaces that people can go to because it was just so dense and so heavy. So that launched the landscape architecture movement, the late 19th century, early 20th century, and people all over the country were building these parks. But the important part about it is that Umstead wanted to be free democratic spaces mm -hmm. where anyone can go regardless of their income level or race, that was basically the launch of the American parks system. So that changed it where now you are welcome to come in, you can sit. And then Robert Moses, believe it or not, was the recreational facilities era. Mm -hmm. 
That's where parks and mm-hmm. recreation came from. And that was basically from the 1930s up until roughly the 1970s. And now parks became a place where people can recreate ball fields and playgrounds. Robert Moses was all credited with that era. He recognized people were jumping into the East River and drowning. Kids were being hit in the street by cars and horse carriages and decided to have these places where kids can go and be safe. People could swim and not drown. But then we moved into the next movement was really the environmental movement. Many cities, we started seeing the industrial revolution and manufacturing cities decline. And we had all this industrial land, usually near waterfronts. And so this movement wanted to go in, heal this land, remove the industry, and then give it back to the public. And you see that in New York, uh, you see that in cities across the country where they just reinvented their industrial property, cleaned it up, and brought it back to public use. Now in the 21st century, people are returning to cities, and now parks mean something totally different. It's not just for physical health, but for mental health. Mm -hmm. It also helps us battle climate change. They're economic drivers for so many places and creates more value in a more livable city greenway systems. And so it changed tremendously uh, in the 21st century. So that's kind of the evolution of park design. You see the profession responding, where now we're not just looking at parks, but public spaces, streets, sidewalks, plazas, the public realm. And so now you see this whole evolution in park design from where it was parks and gardens to where today it's social gathering places where people can come together and create memories and get healthy, both uh, mentally and physically. And it just makes cities not just lovable, but also livable. Well, everything you said to embodies and encapsulates urban planning in a good sense mm-hmm. anyway. I mean, to me, that's kind of the, the bridge between the two. So when you said, hey, I, I don't want to be leading up something that's 80% ops and 20% planning, but you went into it the other way, what were the challenges around that from what you were dealing with in New York City? And how does that relate to our profession as a whole? Well, number one, what really drew me to the position is the mayor at the time, Mayor de Blasio, looked at New York City and said it was a tale of two cities. And particularly with Parks, uh, his concern uh, was that um, he wanted to make sure we had an equitable park system. And so I had to do this analysis and I had to determine how equitable was New York City. Mm -hmm. And it turned out after New York City spent close to $6 billion over 20 years, There were about 200 parks of New York City's 2000 that received little to no investment. And we believed that that wasn't fair, it wasn't equitable, and we had to figure out a way of making sure every community had a quality park that they could enjoy. That was a big challenge. The other challenge was that our projects were taken too long and I wanted to get them completed a lot quicker because I didn't want these communities to suffer because I knew what a park meant to each and every community in New York City. So that clearly was a challenge. Uh, The other one, believe it or not, New York City was kind of stuck in 20th century practices. And so I had to kind of reinvigorate it. And we brought planning and placemaking to the Parks Department. And so a lot of the commissioners, other commissioners and the elected officials thought how unique it is to come in with a planner's perspective because if these parks don't sit in isolation, they're connected to neighborhoods. They're connected to commercial districts. They're connected to so many things other than they're not just these green islands. And how can we reposition these parks, these public spaces to be the center of community that can help people get healthy and heal and connect and create memories? And that really was the gateway, but that was the challenge initially that people just saw parks as these nice things to have, not necessary. And I wanted to make it the center of everyday life in New York City. Yeah. And, and a couple of questions I was going to have, and it related, man, we just had a conversation in our own city here about a park that had not historically had a bathroom and they want to put a bathroom in. And you just kind of go, really, there's a controversy about it. I, I understand it. I get it, you know, in, in certain places. So I'd imagine that some of the th- parks, maybe I'm going to guess, maybe you fill in the blanks here, but I wonder if you had any pushback on any types of investment in that that you wanted to make yeah tell us about it well the main one was there was this initiative now 
the good thing about traveling is that I'm traveling, seeing parks all over the place while I was appointed commissioner. I'm like, what is up with all these ga- these gates and fences around parks? <laughs> and so I wanted to make sure that our parks were more accessible because there were some parks you could see the park, but you'd have to walk five, 10 minutes to get in it because there were walls or gates surrounding it. So to make a long story short, we came up with this proposal called Parks Without Borders. And that was to create a more seamless park system to remove barriers, walls, gates, or lower them and fences so that people visually would have more access, but also physically they would have more access. When New Yorkers heard that I was taking the fences down and I tried to tell them, I know these playgrounds are gated. No one's going to go in there and beat up a swing. I didn't get it, but New York in the 80s, 70s and 80s was a dangerous place. So we thought if we just put up tall seven foot spiked fences were around our playgrounds. So I decided to lower the fence. I did not want to imprison our children and citizens just to enjoy public space. Wow, that became extremely controversial when it was announced. I went to every borough and had a conversation about what the vision was. We launched it as a pilot and we allowed the community to select the parks to enjoy this treatment. And so from my perspective, the Parks of Borders was really envisioning not just a park, but the sidewalk as the outer park. And when we started to redesign parks, we did the outer park, the sidewalk, in some cases, the street, and they were removed or lowered fences to make the parks more accessible. It started as a pilot with eight. I think when I left, we completed over 150. The public initially said, don't you take down our fences. Now they were saying, please (laughs) take down the fence, Mm -hmm. open it up. And it became safer for seniors, for women, because now they can see around them. And the police loved it because now they can just see right inside. And it was just a huge, huge success. And we didn't have to buy any other parkland. We already owned it. We just reimagined how to have a seamless public realm. Yeah. So I, I will share with you a story that I think on that note, you will greatly appreciate it. We appreciate earlier in my consulting career. Anyway, I had gone out to a community here in the state of Idaho and just go around and look around. And, you know, my job was to kind of take inventory of these types of spaces. And lo and behold, I see what's called the community track. Okay, great. That's awesome. Right. All of these, you know, people's names of who donated and it was this, you know, real gem for the community. Only one problem. It was completely flanked by razor wire, like literally barbed razor wire all the way around it. And I'm going, what on earth is this community track? And why are we, you know, being treated as if we're visiting some prison or something? And I kept asking all the leadership, mayor, you know, public works, why, why? Nobody could answer. Uh, and a couple of years ago, it was one of two things on my bucket list as a professional, you know, planner to get done, and and that was one of them. And I like a year ago went out there again, new mayor, new leadership. Hey, it's still there. What the heck? That mayor, however, said we're going to find out. She found out, and I'm happy to report it has been removed. So, <laughs> yay. It was because the warden at Shawshank Prison had given <laughs> yeah. to the original construction. And... Right. And what was funny is that after the parks of borders treatment, the parks got safer. Just yeah. as a yeah. note. And so I think yeah. that's when people said, let's keep doing this. And it's, New York City is still doing it, by the way. There you go. One of the things that struck me, Mitch, when you were talking is parks meaning so many different things to different people, both historically and just even now. Um but that all that really is about building community. And so as Chris started talking and you were talking about, you know, fenced off parks or razor wire, it's a bit symbolic even, you know, of how, how we're fencing off folks from community. Um, so what do you think are some good things that you've seen happen or initiatives either in your work or others? There are initiatives to address that, you know, lack of community or in inequalities that happen that essentially are breaking our communities apart, not bringing them together. Yeah. Well, there are two points. Uh, Number one, as I stated, we came up in New York City with something called a framework for an equitable future. And it was our focus to look at those parks that have been neglected for two decades, and it literally would break your heart. I want to share one story before I get to the other point, is I'll never forget in Brooklyn, it was one of these parks neglected for over 20 years. Uh, We did a full event renovation. It was one of your typical Robert Moses playgrounds all asphalt and high fences. Uh, We changed that park. 
a track, synthetic turf, new play equipment, rain gardens, rain gardens. On opening day, a little boy about Hispanic would not go into the park. And we have a big celebration. And we went to that little boy to ask him, why won't you come in? And his response was, he didn't know how much it cost. It looked that nice. Mm -hmm. He did not think that was a public park. And that broke my heart that nothing like that in that neighborhood existed. And so for us, it was so important to do these projects as quickly as possible. And he went to the park, started running around the track. And I said, his life and all the children in this neighborhood is going to change. How sad is it that we finally did a park in their neighborhood and they thought they had to pay because they thought maybe it was commercial. It wasn't for them. We focused on all of these inequities. We looked at where our investment was going and we prioritized those communities that needed it most. So that was one way we dealt with the inequity. The other one was that we learned how to listen. And as a planner, you know, we had more public meetings than the planning department did because I had a budget of over a billion dollars. We were doing 640 projects in New York City and every meeting had to reach out to the community. What Before I got there, they were held during the day. I said, mm -hmm. no, that's not going to work. We moved them to the evening, made it focused on schools and children because they're the use of our park. And we started inviting people in to listen to their needs. And so for me, that was a way of leveling it. We didn't want to tell them what they wanted. We had to work with them. Children are creative. They want tree houses and Ferris wheels and all the cool stuff, which we can't build. But there was buy-in. And there's this video when this project won an award where the residents said they listened. That doesn't often happen. So there was this partnership. The community became stewards. And little by little, they kept feeling, wow, we now see the equality. We now see the equity that our parks are now being paid attention to that was not the case in the past. So it really just changed the whole psychology. And in those parks as well, crime went down. Mm -hmm. If you give quality material and reach out to the community, they respect you back in return. So for me, that was just a... It was a privilege and honor to help New Yorkers, uh, one, address the inequity, but at the same time also address the inequality that was happening in New York City in our park system. The it's other awesome that people make, own was, that. Yeah, they right. own that. The okay. other one we started hearing is green gentrification, which was mm -hmm. this new term. And so I pushed back very hard because I said, here's the problem. Number one, I have not seen a neighborhood park lead to gentrification. But if I hear what you're saying, if I do nothing, you accuse me of neglect. If I do something, you accuse me of gentrification. I, as a commissioner, will not deny these generations of children uh, another 10 or 20 years of lack of investment and having a poor quality park because a few people think it may gentrify the neighborhood, which was not the case. So I had to push back very hard because I was determined of those 215 parks that were neglected, that I want to make sure that those kids, those seniors, those families had a quality place that they can live and enjoy themselves. I think what you said too, it was going to be a question of mine, but you just answered it. <laughs> I think when we talk about things like New York City and other major metros, I think it can be intimidating simply because of the scale and history and stuff for other places. But you just said investment, listening, and thinking about human interaction. And to me, those are simple things that from the town of 5,000 up to the major metros get at the fundamental parts of this and not just in, in parks and planning. So when you started and kind of gave your background, you said, talking about 2010 to 2013 and the planning profession being challenged. Sabrina talked about that being the case today. For the young planners out there and these challenges we're going through, what do you see as the way through it? What do you see as, as the next step, whether it's parks planning, urban planning, all the facets that we represent? Before I do that, I want to take a step back because I have to say it's what kept me passionate throughout my entire career. As, as soon as you can, you better learn your sense of purpose. You know, mm -hmm. I was very fortunate that I read the Code of Ethics. Uh, I fell in love with those Code of Ethics. And it taught me that my role is to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, the public interest, to be a guardian for the future, and to think about those who aren't even born yet. We have all these very difficult emerging challenges, and you are the profession that's going to figure out how do we help address 
the uncertainty about the future. How do we plan for both present and future generations? So you have to understand your sense of purpose. It takes some courage. It takes commitment. But I always say, we're one of the few professions that think about this day and night. How are we going to help our community prepare for these emerging issues? We now have extreme weather events. We're now having changing demographics. We're now having people moving at post-COVID. Planners are at the forefront helping communities evolve and elected officials make decisions. So understand your sense of purpose. And for me, that's something that I've always embraced. And it gave me that fuel, that passion that I am determined to be that guardian of both present and future generations. And so that's why I tell young people, learn your purpose as soon as you can. Every profession has a code of ethics. They communicate values. Some are aspirational and read it on a regular basis. And that will give you the fire, the determination and the passion to be diligent about everything you do to help places get better. So I remember seeing you speak the first time and you talked about keeping that there in the pocket of your jacket. Is it still there? <laughs> no, it's in here now. This is, <laughs> it's, I speak on it so much. It's I was just in Ottawa <laughs> speaking to the Ontario planners and they're going through some challenging changes with that provincial government. And so I had to give a very similar speech literally two days ago. And uh, I can't say there was one guy in his middle middle age and he came up to me and said thank you so much because I, I forgot why i'm doing what i'm doing i lost my sense of purpose and mm -hmm. so he said it reinvigorated him as well as a, a lot of young people so learn your sense of per find your sense of purpose and do not let it go so mitchell i'm going to ask you um a, a bunch of years ago i i went to i was invited to a conference and the keynote was a futurist. And I thought, a futurist. Now that, what a what a job title, right? <laughs> just, just get to sit around and think what's going to be happening in the future. And who knows if, I mean, if they're wrong, no one's going to call them on it, right? I mean, and, they, and, pay, and pay me inflation-based <laughs> right. 2050 right. rates while you're doing it. Please. Right, yeah, sure. Okay, I missed that one. But I'm going to ask you to to think ahead. You've you've been doing this for a while to see some of those trends that you have mentioned and kind of where we're going. I mean, you saw how things have unfolded, and especially like you said in in New York and the situation in the '80s, all the way up through when you were there, and now going through the pandemic. And I'm just kind of curious, what do you see? When people ask or you think about the next iteration, I, I'm fascinated, but you've mentioned so many of these iterations right. of, of our park spaces. What is it that you see going into 2030, 2040? Uh, well, one, uh, the one change COVID kind of shocked everyone was the millennials leaving cities. We thought that would never happen and something happened. I mean, everyone was wrong. They thought they're gonna be urban for the rest of their lives. And to some extent, they still are. But there was something about COVID where the millennials started moving out to second tier cities and other places. And so that's something that we did not expect. But one of the things I have noticed uh, is that there is now a rediscovery of parks and public spaces. People are now looking at the streets, the sidewalks, and they want to reinvent it. A city, whether it's a 15 minute city, whether it's what's happening in Paris or London or Madrid, or New York, they're reclaiming the public realm, which is streets, sidewalks, parks, and plazas for people and not for cars. I believe that trend is going to continue uh, to make better use of our cities. Uh, you're seeing in New York City, they're just closing off streets as a group called 25 by 25, which has closed 25 miles of streets by 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, where Paris, you know, car free, I struggle with the car free, but there's this rediscovery of the public ground. I often say that people may eat and sleep in their apartments or homes, but they live in a public space. They live in the public ground. And our cities are being driven by the experience of place. And you cannot do that if our streets are dominated by cars. So I see that trend continuing and I don't see that changing anytime soon. We also have to recognize we have a, a really an aging population. And so I'm looking at the reinvention of sidewalks that has more benches and street furnitures, make it act more like our outdoor living room, whether it's a stroller or a wheelchair or someone has a disability or just to take a break. Uh, let's now look at our sidewalks as part of our infrastructure to make our cities more livable versus just having signs and meters 
make it better and more livable for people. I do see that trend, at least that's my hope, continuing in the future. And parks being looked at multiple ways, not just for recreation and mental health, but also for stormwater, to cool our cities, to uh, be an economic driver, that parks serve multiple purposes. And I wanna make sure people understand that so they don't just look at it as this green space with trees and a place to play, but actually becomes a vital essential part of our city's infrastructure. You're seeing more and more articles, we need more trees, we need sponges, and we can't just look at parks as just a place for recreation. It's now gonna be a vital, vital part of our city's infrastructure. So thinking about, you know, young planners keeping their purpose there, especially new folks. When you think about, I'm starting to get to the age where I'm starting to call the young generation that, um, the the newer incoming generations of planners and you know, where they're coming in through the process, right? Where, where they're coming in through the history. What are things about this kind of new class of planners that excites you? What is it that you see that you're like, oh, I wish... I wish we would have had that or like it's, you know, yeah. it gives you hope. Well, what gives me hope? And I said, you know, find a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. Many of them right now are purpose driven. You know, they are volunteering, but it has to have one condition. It's got to have a purpose or they'll walk. Right. They're not going to become an intern just to do busy work. They're now committed to causes that are very serious to them with the climate being one of the top ones. Uh, rethinking of our transportation mm -hmm. system is another one. So what gives me hope is that they're very they're very much purpose-driven. Another thing that gives me hope was we're in an age of very divisive politics. Yes. Uh, I think one of the things I had talked about maybe 15 years ago and predicted that the 2020s was going to be one of the most challenging periods in nation history because of the changing demographics. Now some segments of our population will not act well to that demographic change. But I see something different in the younger generation. They don't see the demographic change the same way as the older generation does. So I have hope that all this disruption that's happening now will normalize to get America back where it used to be with this young generation leading the way because at this stage, they're, they're purpose driven. I'm just asking them, do not lose that sense of purpose. We need you to continue to speak out and to do the research and to advocate uh, what the type of cities and places and towns we want for the future. So they give me hope because they are a purpose-driven generation. Mm -hmm. I just don't want them to lose it. Yeah. Well, I mean, my, my daughter's not in planning, but at 21, um, there is an expectation for her from her job that what she does for money fills her up, fills her cup. Um, and and I I really respect the fact that she is willing to make other sacrifices in her life to make sure she is filled up. Yes. Um, and so that that's awesome in any of that. But applying that to planning does give you a lot of hope. Even at our consulting firm, we had a retreat and I had to speak up and I say, I want to be clear. Are we going to be profit driven or purpose driven? And after a long debate, they said, we're going to be both. So <laughs> uh, but it was good because as a private consulting firm, and I said, I have to tell you, and I realized most of young people coming into the firm are very purpose driven. They're not mm -hmm. profit driven. You're going so to get selected based on that purpose more so than the things we exactly. looked at in the past. Yes. So, mm -hmm. so to hear from their point of view, they're very concerned about the future of our planet. They know they will inherit it. Uh, and we see it in the volunteer work that they do, um, how they approach some of our projects. So you can tell that they're very purpose driven. I just want to make sure they don't lose it. Mm. Uh, if I have time for this side story. The reason why I say that, I had a colleague of mine who was a professor, and she asked her students the first day of class to write down why they were pursuing the planning profession. Mm. She held these essays, and 10 years later, they had a reunion. And to their surprise, she pulled out the essays, and those that came back, she asked them to read it. Mm. Some of them cried, and others realized that they forgot why they chose his profession, but the profession after 10 years for some of them, you know, the politics sucked the living life out of them and they were happy to be reminded why they decided to pursue this career path in the first place. So a lot of them got very reinvigorated and thanked her and kept the essays. But to me, I just want to remind these young people, write it down so that when those tough times come, it will remind you why you chose this career in the first place. And for me, after 40 years, I made the right decision. And if I had to do it all over again, I would be an urban planner. 
Mm-hmm. Thank, thank you for that. And Chris, I didn't realize this episode was going to be a bit of therapy, but I think we might need to <laughs> go back. Many, and many of them, many of them end up. Yes. Being, yeah. Yes. So, very, so thank you for that. Very cathartic. All right, Mitchell, you're on the consulting side back in North Carolina. What's the coolest project you got going? Wow. Uh, well, one that's going to council um, in a few days. Uh, there was a uh, monument in Asheville. You may know it. The Vance Monument in yeah. Pack Square. Uh, after the Black Lives Matter movement, there were a lot of protests, and they asked the county and the city to remove the monument. Uh, the city and county did that, but the base remains. But they wanted, and because of the history of this governor tied to slavery and white supremacy, and so they brought me in to help with the community, work with the community, uh, to redesign the square, at least a vision for the square that really promoted healing reconciliation and unity. And so I was there for a little less than a year, worked through that process. Uh, we initially released the design in July and uh, it will should be adopted uh, next week. It already got interest from the Mellon Foundation and gave it $3 million to start the project, but it's being promoted as a space, as a meditation garden, more of a gathering place for all people, a place for unity, for healing, And now there's a street between the square and what they call the block, the historic black community, that now there's going to be a cultural corridor to elevate those stories and voices. So that's the one I'm very most excited about. It's the one I had just completed. And to me that I was emotionally invested and moved by the stories we heard from the community that lived in the Ashevillians, as they call them. So that is the one that's most current, Mm. but the one I'm so excited that can move forward. Yeah, and right. having grown up in that area and lived there, that that healing part is something long overdue uh, in that community and in that space. So that's awesome to hear. So we're going to transition over to the lightning round in just a second. I just one quick point. It's crazy. This is the second time in a week that I've I've had this 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 same reflection on something that happened in my early career that I think you'll appreciate. I was asked or hypothetically asked by a prominent architect architect here in Idaho at a conference I went to where he stood in front of a pretty large room and said, what will your legacy be? And I just, I'm like, what a simple question, right? What a simple question, but yet bang, just hit you right between the eyes. And and I think that to your point about purpose and legacy, pretty synonymous terms, uh, I would hope that all of us listening to this as planners understand what our own purposes are and what we want our legacy to be. And while some some people might get caught up in that, think that's too grandiose or something. I don't know. Maybe, you know, like the day to day, like, ah, do I really have a legacy? Of, yeah, you do. <laughs> Hopefully you understand what it can be. My one ask of our profession and my one ask, especially of the next generation is to have patience (laughs) and let that legacy happen. Let it build, let that momentum grow. Cause in our profession, man, it's not like shooting a basketball where either you made or you didn't and you know, instantly, right. It's going to take a minute. I don't know if you have anything to add or or, or say on that. I mean, people would laugh at this, but it was something um, I actually had stated when I first became commissioner And I talked about this culture of care and one of the local publications thought it was a joke. Mm -hmm. Uh, But to me, I want to differentiate between maintenance and care. Maintenance Mm -hmm. is a checklist. Caring comes from a different part of the soul. When I raised my daughter, the beautiful young lady she is, I did not maintain her as she grew up. I cared and nurtured her. And for me in all of my work, I believe in this culture of care for the park, for the park goers for staff, to me was very important. And my legacy, my passion for place and people, to me, the foundation was care. When I left as commissioner, even though I had a great legacy, did amazing work, um, when staff came up to me, the one thing they said is, we're going to miss you. But the one thing we're going to miss the most is that you cared. It -hmm. was sincere and we felt it. And it motivated us. It motivated us to do our jobs even better. So to me, that's something I embrace. I And when I was leaving, someone actually said, okay, I see what he was talking about. But that was the yeah. one thing that that that, let, that, that uh, staff was left with. And they came to me and said, we appreciated it. But all the other things are there, but I did everything with care, with empathy uh, in all of my work. Uh, so to me, that is something I'm sure over time will be replaced, 
Uh, but the memories of caring, the memories of empathy, the memories of trying to, trying to create these great places for people from the right place of the heart, to me, I hope will be that standing legacy that people mm -hmm. will remember. Well, well, and I, what... I think too, Chris, because I, one of our mutual friends, Lauren Driscoll, when we had her on here was talking about, you know, you got to work that desk and process that fence permit. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to find that legacy in a fence permit or a perfectly written development review staff report. So yeah, having patience. Yeah. Well, and I, I feel really bad about you having such a beautiful statement and so eloquently put that now I'm going to transition to the lightning round with questions. <laughs> that... <laughs> so, but I'm going to jump right in and go for it. So first of all, thank you for all of your meaningful comments and our questions. We really certainly appreciate that. But Mitchell Silver, I'm going to put you on the hot seat, my friend. Here we go. Are you ready? All right. I'm ready. Pick Pickleball. Are you in or are you out? <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> why are you in well i played the sport uh and fell in love with it immediately it is fun it is great for all ages uh it's it's portable mm -hmm. uh and it is just growing and leaps and bounds and anything that gets people to get out and get healthy i'm all for bingo. it bingo there you go Awesome. I, I, I've hit the age. I've hit the age where I'm, I'm thinking about it. I was that never in tennis, ball, but I'm like, yeah, that <laughs> wiffle ball really helps you out, no matter how hard yeah. you hit it. Just stay out of the kitchen. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> All right, I got. I have one for you. So I actually wrote down in notes when you said consider a doctor of cities. That was the best title ever. So give me another one for what you would call a planner. If you were to create a new title instead of using this word planner, mm. what would you call it? It has to be three. Uh, okay, guardian, you can have three. Guardian, protector, and healer. Awesome. Mm. Favorite awesome. New York City train line? <laughs> oh, Q. Why? I grew up next to the Q. That okay. was my train. <laughs> I, I orient my whole self on the Q train. It started as a D train. They transitioned to the Q, but that was the line, the bright line that I lived my entire life. So right away is the Q. What kind of memory did you have going back to work there and in those new roles and being able to oh, see it through a new light? It was overwhelming. I go back once a month. I need to get my New York City fix. <laughs> I mean, I spent my entire life there. Everything happened there. So every time I go back, any block I walk down, the memories start flooding back, particularly mm -hmm. Prospect Park, because that's where I spent a lot of my time. My brother passed away. We ran around the park on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. and so uh, to me, it's just every corner. So it's just overwhelming when I go back to New York. The memories are on almost every street. Awesome. Okay. Your top three favorite New York pizza toppings. Oh, I'm going to be boring. I just <laughs> do cheese. <laughs> but family pizza on Parkside and Flatbush, uh, to me, mm -hmm. uh, I know they changed owners. Uh, people laugh about it, but I have to go back and have a real New York City pizza and his family pizza on Parkside Avenue in Flatbush. I was All thinking right. back to the movie but Elf. I'm just of, you know, there's, oh, there's other topics, the oregano and red mm -hmm. pepper. Does that count? Oh, yeah. yeah that's that's simple. It. Simple. It's, the crust does all the talking, simple. right? I mean, that's, uh, that's the healer part of it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> not including New York City, what is your favorite city? London. Hmm. Why? Pick three it reasons. It has a New York vibe to it, but it's so different. I love history. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember a professor said in a weird way, uh, what he loved about Europe is you, you, you can spit and wherever you spit, you'll hit the 10th century. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> wow. so he said, you, you can't spit without missing the 10th century. Oh. And I was just like, whoa. Uh, I've been to London so many times and it has a lot of similarities to New York. I just love the history. I love the parks. Uh, yes, you have to watch where you step and there's all these things on the curb to tell you which way to look. But I'm just fascinated by just the history uh, of, of London. Doesn't have a strong grid, but I just love the unpredictability of that city. But just the history. I just love London. Cool. Okay. So now that you're a resident of North Carolina... I got to think you, your comparison between that impulsive thing, either a hot dog cart in New York City mm. or boiled boiled peanuts in North Carolina. Yeah, I love North Carolina. They laugh at me because I say I'm a New Yorker living in North Carolina. 
Uh, it's a special place. I mean, the, the Raleigh, North Carolina is now viewed as one of the, the hottest places to move to. Austin, Raleigh, they're named in the same breath. Uh, my son's there. My grandkids are there. Uh, that's where I'm going to retire. Uh, it's a great community uh, and, and a great food scene. So uh, it, it can't place for New York, <laughs> but I do go back once a month to get my fix. My daughter's in New York. Uh, but it is a great place. And you can get your hot dogs it, at Char Grill and you're fine. Yeah, you can. Right? Yeah. So they do have their, I'm trying to think what is authentic Raleigh uh, <laughs> in terms of nothing comes oh. to mind. Uh, I try to eat properly. So I'll, I'll have to come back on the show and tell you what that is, but nothing comes top of mind. What is it? <laughs> Coop, Cooper's Barbecue? Is that the one? I, I'm not sure if they're still there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, but yes, that is a uh, barbecue is great. The pit, great restaurant. Ah, yes. The pit. Yeah. Mets or Yankees? Mets. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, that's it's kind of been a rough year for you. <laughs> maybe, maybe not a deep one here, but Chris has this theory of he's found in multiple cities that if there was an Olmstead park, either him, his sons, his yeah, companies, yeah. we tried to run a freeway through it. Do you think that would make a, a good book? I was in Portland, Maine a couple of weeks ago reading a thing about Olmstead and guess what they did? They ran 295 partially through an Olmstead park and like it fits the bill. What's what's your take on that? Well, all I can say is that as parks commissioner, it was my pleasure to undo some of Robert Moses' work. <laughs> And I sat in the same chair he sat in, um, but uh, a lot of it now is being undone. So let me just have that take on it. Uh, I love Umstead's vision of what he wanted to do. And then Robert Moses came in and just, he's the one who built the zoo. He did a lot of disruptive things. There were two Robert Moseses, pre-war and post-war. Mm. We love the pre-war Robert Moses, the post-war. He got a little too much power, uh, but now many people are undoing his work, including an announcement just this week. Uh, to remove the FDR drive to make it all open in the boulevard. So uh, poor Robert Moses. Um, <laughs> Clint Hyde, uh, but there's no question he's a, a legendary figure. I got one more to wrap us up this section. So you're you're in North Carolina day after your retirement, and you're going to write a book about the future of planning. What do you title it? I actually had an idea for a book, so I, I'll see if I can... Uh, I was going to title the book, believe it or not, 2042. Hmm. I know that's a little bit vague, but I was going to title the book 2042. When I write the book, you'll understand why. <laughs> All right. Well, there we go. We're setting it up for your book tour. It's like yeah. when Orwell said, I'm going to write one called 1984. And I was like, mm, this one, this could be intriguing. <laughs> I want it to be that vague, 2042. Uh, and I do have a, a, a book, a chapter. I wrote a chapter in the book. It's about designing with empathy, mm. uh, planning and designing with empathy. So that book comes out in January. So uh, a lot of my feelings and thoughts, a lot of how I approached planning is in there. So there's, it's, I wrote the afterward. But uh, yeah, 2042. There now I'm go. it. Now this on our podcast. So uh, I look. I'm looking to semi-retire in a couple of years, okay. and the thing to do is work on that book. Well, you well, committed one... to it. One yes. more, one more thing you don't know is that uh, we have a partnership with our friends at Island Press Publishing. So, <laughs> Island Press, did you hear that? <laughs> they might they, be knocking on your door. <laughs> and and Island Press is publishing the book. Empathy, empathetic, empathetic design is. I love Island. it. Sure. Looking forward Good. to reading that one. There you go. All right. Well, Mitchell Silver principal at mcadams and legend is that a good word i'm gonna call you that you may not want to call yourself that but i'll call you that anybody who's in a top 100 of most influential in the world is uh deserving of that status so let me get away with it by calling you legend thank you for joining the planning commission podcast thank you i appreciate it all right Okay, to our listeners, make sure you head on over to our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. Subscribe, like, and give us your feedback. We certainly appreciate it. Fellow commissioners, thank you so much for your time. May I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All right. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll see you next time. Hey, everybody. Commissioner Danley here. Would you like to see more, hear more? Well, we got you covered. Go to our website, www.theplanningcommissionpodcast.com. It's got everything you want. Guests? Yep. 
past episodes, the video, the audio, even our whiskey pairing, links to everything about all the people we've had on, books, websites, you name it. It's unbelievable. If you want to reach out to us, please, we'd be more than happy to chat. You can email us, planningcommissionpodcast at gmail.com. If you want to tweet at us, go for it, at planningcommish. We're also on YouTube with the Planning Commission Podcast channel, Facebook. Heck, send us a carrier pigeon if you need to. We'd love to hear from you about ideas, guests, you name it. Thank you for listening. We appreciate it. We'll keep doing our thing. You keep doing yours. Have a good one.